Good morning, I'm Dr. Golden. I'm the site director for infectious diseases at the St. Raphael campus for Yale New Haven Hospital. And I'm gonna review today infections related to cardiovascular implantable electronic devices or CIED. So just to give a sense of the background of the use of these devices, they're generally very widely used for treatment of heart failure and arrhythmias, both bradycardia and tachyarrhythmias. They are used worldwide in very large numbers of patients with estimates of well over a million devices placed annually. As the number of devices has increased, not surprisingly, the number of infections related to the devices has increased as well, with a 124% increase in the decade from 1990 to 1999. So translating those numbers, it's estimated that overall the incidence of cardiovascular device infections is about 1.9 per thousand device years. There are a number of different ways that these devices can be infected. So this can be isolated involvement of the generator pocket, and that's estimated to be about 1.37 per thousand device years, or it can be associated with a more invasive infection with bacteremia, and that's estimated to be about 1.4 infections per thousand device years. Not all devices are created equally in terms of their risk for infection, and it's known that the risk is higher for patients who have uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators as opposed to simple pacemakers. So there are certain patient factors that seem to predispose them to uh, infection. So one of the most uh, helpful ways to think about this is to divide the risk factors um, in terms of procedure or device factors, and then factors unique to the patients themselves. So in terms of procedure or device factors, bleeding or hematoma at the site of the generator pocket is an important risk, partly because blood is such excellent culture media, but also because of pressure from uh, accumulating hematoma and hypoxia. Implantation of devices with multiple leads are higher risk devices. Patients who've had revision or replacement of a previous device, those patients are at higher risk. And that's a substantial increase in risk with up to two and a half fold increase in pocket related events as compared to patients who are having a new device placed. Procedure time seems to be an important risk factor with more prolonged procedures being associated with risk of infection. Temporary pacers are at higher risk than permanent pacers, and not surprisingly, operator inexperience is an important risk factor. In terms of the patient factor, um, I've listed a number of these on this slide, so I don't think any of these are particularly surprising older age and associated comorbidities like chronic kidney disease, heart failure, diabetes, poor wound healing. Notably, recent fever uh, is associated with a higher risk of infection, and so that's important when we as ID consultants get called to assess the appropriateness of proceeding with device uh, implantation. So just to say another word or two about pocket hematomas as a risk factor, uh, there was a large study that was published um, with the nice acronym of BRUISE control, uh, and I've highlighted the letters here to form the acronym BRUISE. So it's Bridge uh, or Continued Coumadin for Device Surgery Randomized Controlled Trial. So overall in this group, the one-year device-related infection rate was about 2.5%. Infection occurred in 11% of patients with uh, hematomas versus only 1.5% of patients who didn't have a hematoma. And so that was kind of a nice study showing the importance of meticulous hemostasis to prevent infections. So when in the course of the patient experience do these devices become infected? So first is at the time of device placement, and you can see um, that's the most important. Similarly, time of device replacement um, is important, so whenever the pocket is manipulated. Um, that can also be 
generator change, an upgrade of the device, or a lead revision. So basically, anytime the skin is broken, there's potential for infection. The time from the placement of the device to onset of the infection is quite variable and can be as short as a couple of days and can be as long as many years. So this slide, and I'm sorry this doesn't project quite as well um, as I would have liked, just links the types of infections that can occur with CIDs and then the clinical infection. So again, in the left column, you can see that it can be manipulation of the pockets, um, and then it can be as a consequence of bacteremia. You can have isolated pocket infections, you can have endocarditis of the valves or of the leads, and that's all um, sort of detailed on that slide. So importantly, what can be done to prevent these infections? Because they're obviously a source of significant morbidity. So first, there's prevention that can be targeted to the time of device placement. And one of the most important interventions is really meticulous skin preparation. And there actually have been studies looking at chlorhexidine versus povidone iodine for skin prep. And it's been shown that the chlorhexidine preparations, which are in an alcohol base, have improved uh, results of decreasing infection. And then it's recommended that patients get systemic antibiotic prophylaxis at the time of device placement. And these follow the typical SKIP guidelines in terms of timing of antibiotic administration. It's recommended that the antibiotic prophylaxis be targeted against staph. If you know that your patient is a MRSA carrier, it's recommended to use vancomycin. If the patient is penicillin allergic, similarly, it's recommended to use vancomycin. Otherwise, cefazolin is the preferred prophylactic drug of choice. We like to recommend that patients have staph aureus screening, which is a nasal swab that will identify whether the patient's a carrier for MSSA, MRSA, both or neither. Um, importantly, it's been well shown that there's no value to continuing antibiotics after that single pre-op prophylactic dose. And one of the things that we often struggle with is to convince our EPS colleagues, our electrophysiology colleagues, not to continue prolonged antibiotics post-device insertion. For patients who are identified as staph aureus carriers, whether it be MSSA or MRSA, pre-op nasal mupirocin for five days, twice a day for five days, can help decrease staph carriage. There have been a number of studies looking at the utility of wrapping the generator in an antibiotic impregnated envelope. So there are some older studies that looked at non-absorbable envelopes as well as more recent ones um, which wrap it in this absorbable mesh envelope that's been impregnated with a combination of minocycline and rifampin. I'm going to talk about that more in, um, in a minute. Importantly, for patients who have established devices in place, there's no evidence that those patients need antibiotic prophylaxis prior to dental work, GI work, or GU work. Oftentimes, they're told by their uh, cardiologists that they should get prophylaxis, but there's no data to support it. And in the American Heart Association guidelines, there's no recommendation to prophylax those individuals. Um, so this is a picture on the uh, lower right-hand side of the slide of what the antibiotic envelope looks like. This is one of the newer devices. The device was first approved in 2008, so it's been around for a while. The best study was a meta-analysis looking at almost 4,500 patients who'd had implantable devices. Um, and you can see there were 1,798 that had the antibiotic envelope and about 2,700 that didn't have the antibiotic envelope. And when they calculated the risk scores for infection, they were pretty similar between the two groups. And this group showed with the meta-analysis um, that there was a 69% relative risk reduction. Um, and you can see in the graph um, on the right that um, the hazard ratio is lower for the patients who had gotten the envelope. Despite this one meta-analysis, 
um, it has not had widespread uptake. And when I spoke with several of the EPS providers that I work with, they felt like there was a higher risk of pocket dehiscence in patients who had these envelopes and they did not feel like they saw a significant decrease in infection in their clinical practice. And so it's not really widely used um, in a lot of institutions. And I think we need more data. Obviously these devices um, are quite expensive. These envelopes are expensive. So there were some caveats also. So not all of the studies that were included in that meta-analysis were equal. So some of the studies used a non-resorbable envelope, whereas the current ones are absorbable. Many of the studies were retrospective. They lacked a control arm. And I think really importantly, one of the authors um, on this meta-analysis was a consultant for the company that makes the product. And so I think we just need more data before this gets widespread use. Okay, so turning a bit now to the types of organisms that are implicated in uh, these device infections. So overall, staph is the primary uh, pathogen, and that can be staph aureus, both MRSA and MSSA, as well as coagulase negative staph. So if you take all strains of staph together, they cause about three quarters of pocket infections and close to 90% of device-related endocarditis. So clearly this is the huge pathogen to worry about. <clears throat> Because staph are often associated with biofilm production, which can make antibiotic penetration really difficult, device extraction for staphylococcal CIEDs is often required. On the right side, I listed sort of the who's who of other pathogens that can be associated with these infections. And notably, you can see that gram-negative pathogens are quite rare, fewer than 10% of all CIED infections. And even more rarely are fungal infections with organisms like Aspergillus and Candida. So how do you make the diagnosis? So as a starting point, it's very important to get several sets of blood cultures, ideally three sets of blood cultures and ideally prior to starting antibiotics. It's recommended that if um, a device infection is suspected, you get blood cultures even if the patient doesn't have a fever. You can culture the drainage of the generator pocket if there is drainage, but very importantly, percutaneous aspirate of the pocket or ultrasound-guided aspirate of the pocket is not recommended. So if the device has eroded through, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that, and there's drainage, that's helpful to culture, but importantly, not to aspirate the pocket. Echocardiography is a really crucial part of the diagnostic workup, and a transesophageal echo is recommended for all patients who have positive blood cultures or if there's a plan to extract the leads. As ID people, we always like to see cultures both from the pocket and from the lead tips if the device is removed. And we always remind our colleagues not to send just swabs, but to actually try to send a syringe full of pus or a tissue specimen if possible, because the yield is much higher. If there's diagnostic uncertainty, so clinical suspicion, but cultures are negative, then there is imaging that can be considered, and the most data um, look at PET-CT scan to help make a diagnosis of infection. It's also important to remember, and we get this question a lot on the consult service, is that seeing a vegetation on the lead is not adequate as a single finding to diagnose lead-related endocarditis. And we know from studies that up to 10% of patients who've had CIEDs will have some uh, evidence of material on the lead, and that is often just bland thrombus. Similarly, while the presence of thrombus on the lead tip is not diagnostic of endocarditis, a normal TEE doesn't fully exclude lead-related endocarditis. And so the echocardiography is a piece of information in putting together a diagnosis. This slide, which also does not 
project well is from up to date, and I encourage people when they're taking care of patients where CIED is being considered to refer to this because it's a really nice and very detailed algorithm um, about how to do the diagnostic workup, and this is a great reference. This is a picture of a patient who had an infected CID, and you can see in that bottom right corner um, sort of the end result of this where the device has eroded through the pocket. So you can see in the top left panel, it's just a little bit red and erythematous, and then over time it kind of evolves. There's more redness, there's drainage. Whenever you see a frankly eroded device like this, obviously the entire system needs to be extracted, and that's one of the absolute indications for device removal. Um, which brings us to the next section, which is how do you treat these infected devices? So device removal can be done either percutaneously um, with laser assistance to remove the leads or via open cardiovascular surgery. There are a number of factors to take in mind um, when considering whether the device can be treated in situ or whether it needs to be removed. So the size of the vegetation is important, how long the device has been in place, the type of device, and whether the patient's already had multiple prior extractions are all factors to consider. Generally, it's recommended that the patients undergo open extraction for larger vegetations which is defined as more than two or three centimeters, or patients who are at increased risk of embolism with a percutaneous extraction. In general, we try to discourage removal of the generator alone without removing the leads. Antibiotics are obviously a cornerstone um, of treatment. Once the device has been removed, it's important to just take a step back and consider whether the patient actually needs a new device. So ideally, patients who've had device infections would be nice not to put hardware back in, so that's a conversation to have with the cardiologist. If a new device is planned, it's recommended that it get placed in a separate site, preferably on the contralateral side. And there's really no good data to guide the timing of when a new device can be placed. Generally, we like to see bacteremia having been cleared any local pocket site infection to have been eradicated. And as a general rule for patients who are pacer dependent or um, defibrillator dependent, it's recommended at least to wait 72 hours, but this is not an evidence-based recommendation. It's sort of a clinical consensus. So the absolute indications for device removal are listed on this slide, so that includes um, device erosion and definitive evidence that the device is infected, if there's purulence around the intrathoracic portion of the lead, patients who have either valvular endocarditis or lead endocarditis, so that's vegetation on the valve versus vegetation on the lead tip, patients who are in sepsis from infection, patients who have persistent bacteremia despite antimicrobial therapy in the presence of a device, should have the device removed. Patients who have fungemia generally should have the device removed. And then there are some indications when you can attempt to salvage the device. So if it's an organism other than Staph aureus and there's a defined other source in the setting of bacteremia, you can consider retaining the device. So that would uh, require a normal TEE, a normal pocket, and no recent device manipulation. So this is going to be a very small subset of patients. So for example, somebody with coag negative staph bacteremia that rapidly cleared um, and maybe had uh, a skin ulcer that you thought could have been a potential source of infection. Um, in general, um, some of the other organisms like gram negatives, pneumococci, or transient bacteremia with organisms that aren't typically associated with endocarditis who have a portal of entry. So again, for example, somebody with an E. coli urinary tract infection um, that cleared rapidly in the setting of a CIED, you wouldn't necessarily have to remove that device. Um, patients who have a very superficial um, skin infection with no concern that the pocket's infected, 
um, can also sometimes be treated without removing the device. So in that situation, you'd like to see sterile blood cultures, perhaps an ultrasound of the pocket that didn't show a fluid collection. Um, overall, the outcomes depend a lot on the management. So somebody who has infection of the generator or endocarditis and doesn't have the device removed can have extremely high mortality, upwards of two-thirds of patients versus 20% if the devices are removed. For the patients who survive a more conservative approach, relapse rates are very high. Again, you can see between 50 and 100% versus very low rates of infection for patients who've had the device um, removed. And um, endovascular infection has high mortality that is maintained uh, even at a year out. And this is just a Kaplan-Meier curve showing overall um, outcomes depending on whether the device was removed or not. So importantly, this is a disease that really carries significant morbidity and mortality. Um, in terms of antibiotic treatment, the duration of therapy depends on what the actual disease is that you're treating. So whether it's just a superficial skin infection versus a pocket infection versus endocarditis. So patients who have negative blood cultures and have only very superficial skin infections can be treated like a cellulitis with short course therapy, seven to 10 days and close follow-up. For patients who have isolated pocket infections and sterile blood cultures, uh, antibiotics are continued a little bit longer, upwards of two weeks. And then um, the durations of therapy start getting longer for patients who have bacteremia. So for example, somebody who has a positive blood culture um, with an organism other than Staph aureus and has the device removed only needs two weeks of therapy. Similar patient who had Staph aureus would get four weeks of therapy. And then um, as is true for all patients with endocarditis, it's recommended to get uh, four to six weeks following device extraction. And here's a short bibliography. So that concludes my talk on cardiovascular device-related infections.